what I'm talking about. So I guess you can already hear me. I'm, I'm muting all of you. Um, just going to wait a little moment because there's still people joining. And since I'm my technical support, <laughs> um, I always have to have them enter. Um, okay. Um, all right. Um, yeah. It's so weird for me still to give a talk in front of um, so many muted people because uh, usually I'm with smaller groups, um, which is kind of nicer. Um, but well, um, let us already, nah, still, yeah, they just wait and then. Okay, so I already start um, a little background like who I am. Um, I'm very happy that you're all here because um, uh, neuroscience is really a very, um, dear topic to me um uh, no um, yeah not be fine no it's okay um neuroscience is a very deep topic to me because for the past 10 years i've been um working in neuroscience which is like my original background and i've been working in research especially with a focus on um, team dynamics and for the same time, I'm also, I've also been working in design thinking as a design thinking coach and moderator. And now I'm basically trying to bring um, these two worlds together. Um, can you just tell me if sort of um, you can all hear me well and see me? Just perfect. Wonderful. Um, then um, I'll just share my screen with you. Um, is it open? No, you should be seeing those two um okay ah, nah, stupid I should have. um yeah. okay just one more second because uh no it's difficult to add the other people um yes can i just click on this now it should be okay um okay just for the structure of the talk today um i'm basically um not aiming wait one more second then it's fine it's open um i think the there was just a question if we're going to open the uh, if we're going to upload the session somewhere and i think the decamp people are going to upload it so you should all be able to to see it afterwards as well um so now that we have uh, yeah. Just one second. Uh, wasn't ex was expecting less people than there are. Um, still, okay. All everybody in, more or less. Um, okay, yeah. So I'm gonna upload the. I think the the people will upload the session um, on the website, or there should be some way of of having it. And you can also um, just email me afterwards, and I can send you slides. There's no problem with that. Um, and so, you know what, I'll just leave my slides. Can you see them if I leave them small? Because then I can handle um, having more people entered and then we'll just do it this way for the beginning. Um, okay, so basically, why do I want to talk about neuroscience today? Um, my, like neuroscience covers um, sort of a huge range of different levels and there's computational neuroscience, um, there's sort of uh, cell culture neuroscience work, there's very different um, aspects of this. Um, but what I've been working with and what I think um, sort of the insights are most relevant for design thinking is um, specifically social cognitive neuroscience. Um, and kind of social neuro, uh, cognitive neuroscience is basically everything um, that works with methods um, that in an indirect way visualize human brain activity. So EEG, fMRI, all those things that you've probably all heard somewhere. Um, and then what is neuroscience and neurodesign? It's basically just applying neuro uh, neuroscience to design thinking or to design teams, um, however you want to call it. But really this, this link between neuroscience and design. Um, I'm part of an initiative um, at HBI um, that is currently driving. This is HBI and at Stanford University. Um, and yeah, so my specific focus on this um, and also especially the focus for this talk 
is going to be the lessons that we can learn from neuroscience for collaboration and design teams. And neuroscience um, in the past um, decades, or especially in the past 10 years, has revealed quite lots of um, not only brain structures, but also mechanisms that shape our behavior. Um, and that, of course, also shape our behavior in collaboration. Um, so I would, I would like to bring to you is basically translate these, these insights from neuroscience that are usually kept within the neuroscience community in neuroscience language um, into design thinking words. Um, and how we're going to do this is that basically I will talk for like probably 25 minutes. Um, and um, if you have understanding questions in between, just put them into the chat and I'll try to answer them. Um, and then after like the 25 minutes, we'll have a QA and a where can you basically um, throw in all your questions while you're chat or while you're speaking. Yeah. Okay. So let us start with, um, I'll now go, I'll just make, can you please, yeah, I'll do full mode screen now from now on. And um, the first thing that I'll show you also is, you need the full screen mode now because, um, here we go because I want you to do a little experiment. Um, that's gonna start with this very ugly um, beginning, but just watch this video, um, that's gonna take like a minute. Okay, so the phenomenon, or not the phenomenon, or the, the principle behind this is called change blindness. Um, and change blindness is basically just um, the, the, the visual, your visual system is made up in a way that you're just blind to changes if they're presented in the way they're done in the video. Um, and so it's just something that in general, your visual system isn't really, um, you, there's more than you see like your perception is always different from that there really is and it's something you know that you've probably heard of in some way or you're aware that they're cognitive biases but it's something we forget in everyday life um, and so it's just one of the very clear reminder that our visual system is really we we think we're very sure of what we see but it's usually not so much there as we think um, and so um, in design thinking terms, we always speak of this, you know, challenge assumptions, challenge your perception, challenge your perception of others, but also challenge your own perception and document your work. Because um, another thing of the visual system is actually that we pay less attention to details um, than we usually think. And um, for example, like there's a blind spot in, in our eye even um, where there's no neurons, um, but we, we don't see it. Our brain just fills it in. Um, so really be aware of these biases. And what I want to do throughout this talk is basically show you other cognitive mechanisms, biases, however you want to call them, that um, impact collaboration in a broader sense. And so, uh, now my mouse swapped, oh no, now. Um, so one brain area that has a very nice name, is, I think, um, is the fusiform phase area. And um, the fusiform phase area uh, is really an area sort of like here in the back end of your brain that is just busy with recognizing faces. It's all it does, more or less. And um, there's also a funny disease called prosopagnosia. And if you have this disease, you're really unable to recognize faces. All people look exactly the same to you. Um, and the amygdala is another um, brain area that has received quite a lot um, of attention in the media, so you may have heard of it. Um, it's mostly occupied with um, sort of fear and emotion processing, but it's also, um, it's also sort of its other task is um, recognizing emotions of other people. Um, and so this is an example of um, 
um, sort of how, how um, where norm people look at when they try to extract emotions from a person's face. Um, and so on the left, you can see where a healthy subject would look. So just like probably all of you guys. Um, and of course, we use the eyes a lot, the nose and the mouth as well. But the eyes is our main focus to, to recognize emotions. And when you have a lesion in the amygdala, what you do is um, you cannot recognize, like you just don't look at other people's eyes. So those people completely miss to look at the eyes and they're very bad at emotion recognition. Um, and of course, there's also lots of, you know, there's not just healthy and amygdala lesion, but there's also lots of different degrees in between. So your individual ability to um, recognize other people's emotion also does depend on just the way your brain is made up. Um, and another thing that this should show us is really the importance of um, being visual um, in design thinking speak because our brain is really hardwired for social information like we're really meant to recognize faces um, and the like and so really preferring users and photos like user photos and storytelling especially around um, characters is not something uh, nice to have in a presentation but um, you know there's really lots of um, good neuroscience evidence um, why you, you should have more storytelling than fact sheets in a presentation. And maybe you can also use that to um, convince people that are a little more conservative. Um, then another, always switch from presentation to this, um, another uh, really prominent feature um, of our brains is how we deal, um, or is the, the nature of reward. Um, so what you see on the left, um, so basically how, how MRI experiments, this is an MRI image, are done is that you always have two conditions that you contrast with each other. So you look at people's brain activity while they're doing one thing and while they're doing another thing. And what you can see here is the comparison on the left, the activation that you have when people um, receive monetary rewards and on the right when they receive social rewards. And what you see, first of all, that it's pretty similar, like um, it's really activating the same brain structures. Um, the thing in the middle, so on the left, that's the only area that is um, activated is the reward area, the mental segmental area. Um, and on the right, um, when you see social reward, you also have additional some prefrontal cortex activity. So um, social structures are engaged. Um, and this is sort of a neuroscience result that um, supports the finding that social reward is really um, kind of more engaging more areas of the brain and at least as strong at monetary rewards. Um, and there's also very good evidence from um, non neuroscience but social science studies. Um, there was a meta study that looked at 92 studies um, in very different countries um, over 120 years, um, and they found that the overlap between job satisfaction and salary is really less than. Um, so there's really um, lots of. Um, as uh, uh, evidence now that really money won't be fun at work. And the biggest fun you can kind of get is through social, um, a social setting, social fun. Because um, what's especially um, driving social reward is something called oxytocin. It's a hormone or a neurotransmitter that um, increases feelings of social reward even further. Um, and so basically the best you can do is design all your team building and team setting activities to foster your oxytocin release. But how do you do that? Um, oxytocin um, itself is kind of the birth hormone. So when you want to, um, it's, it's, its main function is to indu induce birth when women are giving birth. And it's also, for example, released after sex. And it's really like the major bonding hormone in humans. Um, and what it does, if you administer it nasally, as some people have done in studies, um, it increases the trust and empathy you feel towards the stranger. Um, and um, funnily, it also goes the other way around, that when somebody acts towards you trustful and empathically, that increases your oxytocin levels. So it's really this, this thing that oxytocin increases trust, but when you have a trustful um, atmosphere, that also increases people's oxytocin levels, and that in turn fosters their social motivation and their, so, their social rewards feelings. Um, so really oxytocin is something you want to have, and the main stressor for oxytocin, or the main thing that kills us, is stress. Um, so basically, stress is kind of your antidote to, to a good team culture and social rewards. Um, and the interesting thing is also that oxytocin levels influence trustful and empathic behavior, but how can you um, sort of stimulate that in, in team settings? And um, there are actually quite a couple of very, um, yeah, easy 
um, recommendations how to act on oxytocin levels. Um, but I think design thinking is very good already in implementing. Um, the first thing is to recognize excellence, basically just to tell people if they've done something good, it makes them happy, um, it releases their oxytocin. Um, then concrete and challenging goals, so kind of a good design uh, challenge, have been found to increase oxytocin levels in, in laboratory settings. And then building in relationships intentionally and asking for help. So especially if, um, so if you ask for help from, from a team member, for example, or a colleague, that will actually increase your colleagues' oxytocin levels. So being asked for help is something that increases oxytocin in humans. Um, but then in times of, um, especially now that we're all just on our computers and can see each other just okay. over video chats, um, it's even more difficult. How do we do this whole, you know, oxytocin release? Um, and there's one um, nice theory that is called the social baseline theory. And that says that um, kind of social proximity is um, our baseline, like not our, only our psychological baseline, but really also our physiological baseline. And social proximity does lots of good things. It um, sort of acts um, favorably on our neural system and also acts on our cardiovascular system and increases, uh, it decreases anxiety, it decreases stress, um, and it's generally very favorable for health. And if it's not there, if, if social proximity is missing, or even worse, if we feel socially excluded, um, that has very um, detrimental effects on us. Um, and this is one study that um, I think was very interesting and in that it um, showed that social pain actually is physical pain. It's not similar to physical pain, but it's just the same. Um, so the experiment that was done sort of behind this picture is um, not even a very bad social pain because what they did is they put people in MR scanners, so they were just lying in the scanner, and then um, they were shown a um, video cartoon, like a video cartoon. And so there were two cartoon people and the two cartoon people were throwing a ball to each other. And um, occasionally they would also throw the ball to you as the person lying in the scanner. So you just see them throw the ball and then you receive the ball and that's all there is. And then suddenly um, they stop throwing the ball to you. But it's not real people, just two cartoon characters. You're lying in an, MRI, in an MRI scanner. But what you can see in your brain is um, sort of what you can see here in the upper picture is that um, a region that is called your anterior cingulate cortex activates. And it's the same that activates when you feel physical pain. I believe the subject were um, sort of poked with a needle. Um, and that's the comparison. So um, when you feel socially excluded, um, pretty much ident the identical brain structures in, in your brain become activated as when you feel physical pain. And what's even more striking is that when you're given um, painkillers, this effect goes away. So when you receive painkillers, you don't feel the social pain anymore. So it's really just the same. Um, so be aware that when um, you, know, you cause social pain to a team member, it really causes them physical pain. And our brains and bodies really need social proximity. And social exclusion um, is not only something that lets us feel pain, but it also goes further. It lets us react aggressively. Um, so in a setting also, you know, probably you've once in your life at least encountered the situation um, where you kind of feel that all the others are against you and in your body that would trigger um, a pain response and an aggressiveness response. But of course, the only response that will work is responding with even empathic, more pro-social behavior because that was again what triggered oxytocin and embraces the others um, to be more empathic and less exclusive. Um, yeah, so kind of remember social pain is really physical pain and the only response to it is even more pro-social behavior. Um, then um, another um, sort of um, yeah, brain finding that is um, kind of difficult for, for, for corona times is that face-to-face um, -face interaction increases brain synchronization. So when you have two people um, just face to face and face to face, not in front of a video screen. Um, this is less, it's really the eye contact, um, especially, um, that increases how much their brains are synchronized. Um, and there have been several studies researching this. It's also something that's just come up recently because neuroscience always tend to, or used to be focused on, on just researching one person, and only in recent years um, they started looking at people in interaction. Um, and so keeping eye contact is really something um, that is not just a benefit and a nice to have, 
but it's something that helps us get on the same wavelength with our team members through eye contact. And so what we can do nowadays is basically video meetings over phone calls and then um, I'm still waiting for, for the best um, solutions to emerge. Um, and then we have synchronized movement is another um, really striking driver in teamwork. Um, so let's just do a little example. So I'll just um, see my two fingers. And can you please try to just uh, do the same movement that I'm doing? So really trying to um, do like tap in synchrony with me and ideally with all the others on the screen. There we go, yeah. So two people and those two people are very much in synchrony now. Okay, um, can you now try to be very asynchronous to me? So like tap at extremely different times, not only faster, but really very like not in the same rhythm. Okay. Okay, um, difficult over stream. Um, I don't know if you felt the difference, but the second one, tapping asynchronously, should have felt much more difficult. Because um, what happens, okay, see some nodding, very good. Um, what happens in, in um, kind of real life when you're in the same room with each other is um, that you just have, a, your body has a tendency to synchronize your movements with others. So um, it's from if you sit in a rocking chair, um, lots, of done, lots of research on this has been done with rocking chairs. Um, if you sit on a rocking chair, you rock in the same rhythm. If you do finger tapping, you, rock, uh, you synchronize, like you tap in the same rhythm. Um, it's easy to do exactly asynchronous, so just the exact opposite. That is also easy. But everything that's really off is very cognitively challenging. So your body really has this tendency um, to synchronize. Um, and this is not only in your body, but it also extends to your brains. Um, so I've done this study, for example, on drumming, and people in my lab also did with guitar um, playing and with piano playing and with singing. And um, sort of all these... Um, Experiment also others have shown that um, when you synchronize your movements, you also synchronize your brains um, So you basically get on the same wavelength with the other person um, And when you synchronize your brains, you also synchronize your minds um, This is um, just a, the, the results from a study where you can see that um, so what we did is measure um, two people's EG activity while they're we're doing synchronized movements and then you see um, that their brains sort of synchronize from frontal to parietal regions um, in a specific time pattern manner. Um, but it's really this um, synchronizing the brains also synchronizes the minds and that the people are more focused on the same, on the same thing, like their, their joint focus increases too. Um, and if you translate this to design thinking, it's really this bias towards actions, uh, bias towards action. If your bodies move in synchrony, your brains start moving in synchrony too. And if your brains are synchronized, your minds are synchronized, and which is basically something that leads to mutual understanding. Um, there's also been done studies on this hyper EG hyper scanning, it's called, where you measure two people's brain activity at the same time. Um, and there's lots of studies between a speaker and a listener that shows the more the speaker and the listener's brain activity is synchronized, the better they understand each other. Um, so involving bodily actions into your teamwork um, is really something that drives um, the team coherence, um, the team feeling, and also the team performance, as we'll see. Because um, um, we have done other studies that really showed that there was a causal um, impact of this brain synchronization on team performance. Um, this was another study um, that I did um, in our lab. Um, um, so it's always like, you know, neuroscience studies usually look like this, because if you use EEG, you always have to do very repetitive things, because you have to um, measure across various trials. Um, and so here we had patients um, search for things on a screen. And um, what we found is that um, people that um, synchronized more when they uh, worked together actually um, had better performance. So they, they, they found the search targets quicker. Um, and not only was it that we found that brain synchronization, um, yeah, we also found that it increases the shared goals. So people... Um, share that was another study from not our lab that people have more a feeling of uh, working towards the same goal if their brains are very synchronized but it also luckily works the other way around that um, shared goals like having the same shared goals increases the same wavelengths so if you focus on the same thing that also increases um, being on the same wavelengths with your team members um, so focusing together is really something that i think can be very crucial in teamwork 
um, because when you focus jointly, your brain synchronize. Um, and this doesn't mean that, you know, no matter what, everybody always has to focus on the same thing, but it mainly means, um, you know, communicate expectations and focus and deliberately switch between team and individual focus time. So you really make sure that when you are all, when you all want to focus on the same thing, you all do focus on the same thing. And I think especially the, the faces in design thinking, I think one of the, the big powers of this and why this works so well to um, orchestrate people from different backgrounds with different work styles, I think is that you, um, that it really helps to, to find a joint focus um, and a shared goal like repeatedly throughout the project. Um, then empathy. Empathy is a big thing, of course, in design thinking. What would we do without it? But it's also a big thing in neuroscience. Um, there's been lots of um, study or lots of study on empathy. And I'll just um, sort of do another little experiment with you. So can you just um, count how many times I have like a scissors here and how many times I uh, tip on my finger? Okay. You all have a number? Okay. Now, this time, please um, imagine how I feel when I poke the scissors, the scissors into my hand. Okay, did this feel different for you? I think, don't see enough videos, yeah, but I think um, it does, it definitely does if you see me in real, because um, the thing is that, um, when you neglect to focus on emotions, you feel less empathy. So basically the summary of this is, um, you know, when you're just trying to count, um, you just focus on, oh, I count how much time she points. You're very much focused on the task and it's, you just can't feel the empathy you're feeling um, when you specifically focus on my emotions. So you can only really act empathically if there's room to pay attention to others' emotions. Um, and that's why um, in design thinking, we often use dedicated time slots and role to focus on everyone's emotions, like check-ins and debriefs, and of course the coach as a like moderator or overviewer of team dynamics. Um, but um, I would say even, you know, try to use it more. Um, don't only do a check-in in the beginning and a debrief in the, in, the, in the evening, but you can also do it while you're focused on a task, like for the little time slot to specifically monitor everybody's emotion and to try to understand how they feel and feel empathy for them, because it can really benefit your teamwork. Um, why is that? At the brain level, there's um, two very, um, yeah, one very famous network, which is called the default mode network. Um, it's been discovered or it was discovered in the 90s. And um, what actually happened is that um, I told you earlier that you in, in fMRI studies, you always contrast two conditions. So for example, one task, you have a visual task and you contrast this um, with a period where subjects do nothing, um, where they're just what you call the resting period, just lie in the scanner and look at a black screen. And then what people found is um, because, and you do this because we know that of course the brain is always active and there's always some activity going on. Um, but then people realize that when you compare this resting period um, with a task period, no matter what task, it can be a visual task, an attention task, a social task, a social task, not actually a visual task, an um, attention task, kind of any task. And if you compare this with the resting period, there's not only um, areas that sort of increase their activity, but there's also areas that decrease their activity during the actual task. And um, these areas are the ones that you see in this picture in um, green and blue. And they're termed the default mode network because it's kind of the network that is um, active in default situations when you don't do anything. Um, and there's a theory that um, the default mode network is doing a lot more than nothing, um, especially um, a lot of social things that kind of our default mode is the social mode. And all these structures, um, especially midline structures in the middle of the brain, medial prefrontal cortex, for example, is very famous in there, um, are structures that um, focus on social tasks. Um, so it has lots to do, for example, with self-reflection, like reflecting and recognizing your own emotions but also um, reflecting and recognizing on others' emotions. Um, so this again goes back to this empathy thing, try to balance task focus and social focus because the neural networks under task focus and emotion focus really exclude each other. Um, when, whenever you focus on a task, when you do something, your default network, your social network goes down. Um, 
And I think usually in our work, we tend to not forget the task focus. Um, so I think this is really a finding that stresses why we should value social focus and um, make time for this in our, our work. Um, then this is already the last um, real aspect and finding I'd like to talk about, which is that personality also is really in the brain. Um, and that people sometimes have less influence on, on their personality than we sometimes tend to think. Um, what you see here is probably as one of the two most famous patients in neuroscience. Um, his name is Phineas Cage, and he lived around 1850. And uh, he was a railway worker, and what happened to him was that he got this steel thing shut through his head. Um, and surprisingly, he survived with, he was quite like he was released from hospital, I think like two or three days later, like very, very short time. And you see him on the right, he lost his eye, um, but that was pretty much everything. Like he was completely fine, could walk, talk, everything. The only thing, um, his personality changed dramatically. He was like a nice, polite, friendly person. And he turned into a very impulsive, very socially inappropriate, aggressive person. Um, and that was like the first evidence that the structure in the brain where you see the steel thing go through, the prefrontal cortex, um, has really to do a huge deal with personality. And it's particularly involved in um, inhibition and, and compulsory behavior, or not compulsory, imp impulsive behavior. And um, another interesting thing about this is that there is, um, for example, an, an interesting interaction between um, intelligence levels and um, prefrontal, cort prefrontal cortex functioning. Um, and kind of for, for lower intelligence levels, there's no interaction whatsoever. But for higher intelligence levels, there's a very interesting interaction that people with high IQ, but very poor or yeah, relatively poor frontal lobe functioning tend to act very socially inappropriate. They're very impulsive and not very nice. Um, however, the very intelligent people with very good prefrontal cortex functioning, they tend to be also very socially appropriate and very nice people. Um, but the other association that you have with impulsiveness um, is one that is very important for how you balance different work styles um, because impulsiveness is, is one um, yeah one very sort of striking personality um, dimension where people vary quite a lot and um, what you find is when you don't limit impulsive people in their impulsiveness um, they become more creative but they also tend to act less socially appropriate um, so what follows from this is really respect these weaknesses of strengths because um, the benefit of being very impulsive can be that you may be very creative, but the weakness of the strengths is that you may act more socially appropriate or more often than other people. Um, and also try to balance different work styles because um, when impulsive people are not limited in their impulsiveness, um, which means, for example, they can freely choose when they work on one task and when they work on another task, then they become more creative. However, for less impulsive people, they become in a setting uh, where they're not told, when they're not limited in impulsiveness, they become less creative. Um, so you really want to make sure that you balance these different work styles within a team, um, which may hopefully be something that maybe becomes easier in remote settings. Um, but yeah, what I want to close with is um, like the, the very positive note of teamwork, which um, stems from a concept in cognitive science that's called um, shared intentionality. Um, that's a very um, influential uh, theory, like from the last 15 years or so. And that basically says that our ability to jointly focus on something, share our intentions, um, just for the sake of sharing intentions with other, that sort of our ability for human teamwork might be a fundamental human advantage, that this is really what makes us different from other animals, especially from monkeys. Um, and so we're really meant to be um, working in social settings. Um, teamwork is something that may be more our default mode than working by ourselves. Um, and um, yeah, and I think I hope that neuroscience um, can help you a bit in facilitating um, and setting up your, your, your own team settings. And um, if I go for a, for a takeaway, um, then it's really that I just like to, you to be more aware and more intentional of how different brain mechanisms um, influence or shape your behavior, um, also when it comes to teamwork. And um, I think if I'd, your behavior, yeah, of course, um, no, if I'd had to pick um, like the three top uh, takeaways from, from, from the, the insights that I picked. Um, for me, the number one is really try to do everything to get on the same wavelength, um, you know, from um, working on sharing goals, from um, sharing movement, 
Um, then the second one, really valuing social focus and spending time on monitoring um, emotions, your own and others. And definitely um, working on oxytocin. Love, it loves trust and it hates stress, but it's really, um, you want it to be um, sort of high in your team settings. Um, and then just um, a very special thanks to uh, Julia Fontinen, who is kind of the neurodesign initiator and coordinator at um, HPI. And she's also working um, with neurodesign more um, on the side of um, creativity. So um, sort of what in neuroscience is fostering creativity. Um, so if you're interested in um, this aspect, you can also drop her a line or drop me a line to connect you with her. Um, and yeah, feel free to write me an email if you want um, sort of a summary of, um, you know, the, the, the 11 sort of insights from, from neuroscience that I summarized here. And now I will close my screen and open the chat and um, yeah. Uh, rum. Okay. Oh no, somebody suffered seizures. Okay, yeah, oh interesting. Somebody uh, said here that he um, suffered seizures and went through brain surgery and went from being very, very analytical to very creative. That is really interesting. Um, yeah, so please, um, if you have questions, um, I think just uh, demute your micro and um, ask them. Let's just try if that works. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Okay. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Go for it. You're okay. alone now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, actually, regarding the last topic that we need people who are impulsive also because they are really creative, mm -hmm. how to um, make sure that those people are also accepted in the team? Because I, I think we cannot take your slides and say, hey, guys, we need also this guy in our team because he's creative. Mm -hmm. So how, um, how do you manage as a coach to be inclusive for such people? Um... I think it always depends on the specific situation. I mean, one thing is, um, as a coach, I always try to um, try to balance people. So if somebody is very, you know, impulsive and going forward, I try to put them down a little bit so the others are not too overwhelmed. Um, but at the same time, I think um, what it really comes down to, um, whenever you deal with somebody who's sort of difficult or perceived difficult by the others, um, what helps you is really this this big empathy pro social thing. So really, just um, trying um, to give him a space to express his opinion, um, and also give the other space to express their opinion in terms of um, you know in design thinking we have lots of these little things where in the beginning during team building, for example, you um, construct your um, kind of anti-hero. So, um, you know, that you just share with everybody that you may be a very impulsive person and um, that, you know, at times you may interrupt everybody and they should freely tell you when it's too much. Um, and just, you know, sort of this weakness of strengths concept that um, everybody must have weaknesses because everybody also has strengths and they always work together and just being very transparent about them. Um, but yeah, I think difficult to answer in, a, in one sentence. Um, then there was one question from what are some books I should read to understand cognitive biases to keep in mind while designing products? Oh, um, difficult. Um, one incredibly interesting, um, I think that one of the coolest research in psychology is called Den Ariely. Just write this um, to everybody. I oh, can't see how I write them. Well, Dan Ariely, easy. Um, and he has studied lots of, he has a book that's called uh, Predictably Irrational. And it's very interesting about cognitive biases, like the major cognitive biases of people and written in a very um, nice way. So I think this is something to, to read. Then some people are asking um, about, you know, more literature um, on, on sort of the topic, especially when designing products or um, this. And I have to say, I'm sorry, because this is the cool thing about it. Um, um, sort of Julia, me and um, Joaquin also who's in the team. Um, and then the people in Stanford are kind of the first people really working on this because it's really something that is just emerging um, that hasn't been there. And I think one part of this is that in the neuroscience community, like neuroscience are Neuroscientists are mostly neuroscientists, so um, they um, work for the neuroscience community and not really for, um, you know, 
it's not popular science, not sharing with others. And um, especially two-person neuroscience, so um, studying the neuroscience of inter social interactions is something that's just become really a thing in the past 10 years and even less. And 10 years sounds a lot, but in neuroscience, it's very little. And um, I think that's why only in the future more and more will come out. Um, mobbing. Okay. I should read. Yeah, so this was I've read. More example of fossil reward versus monetary rewards um, was one question. I think, um, I mean, the main thing, kind of everything, um, so social reward over monetary reward is, um, I mean, you have lots of other literature from uh, social sciences and like um, econ economics and management studies that shows um, that um, intrinsic motivation is more helpful, um, you know, to um, job satisfaction, engagement and all these than monetary is. Um, but I think that the main thing is really that in the brain, um, there, you don't need much examples. It's very clear that social rewards are really striking and at least as efficient as monetary. Um, what do we know about special types related to illnesses, um, like epilepsy? Um, like there's lots of differences in the brain with epilepsy and, and, and diseases, but, um, this is a bigger question that would need, um, um, Clarification. Um, any further? Um, ah, yeah. Then I have a very uh, nice question because it's my interest. Talking about teams, are there any further studies in cognitive diversity within teams from your side? So um, that comes together with the question: What was your biggest surprise about this topic in all of the years? And that is um, that there's a very, very clear finding in um, neuroscience or especially social psychology. Um, that it's not always beneficial to work in teams um, and especially um, that goes for um, diversity. Um, so if you have um, team members with um, different levels of skill, so different levels of skill in the same skill, um, then um, that is usually detriment decremental for uh, team performance. So when you have um, people that have the same level of skill, so they're all very good or all very bad in a certain thing, then usually when they work together, they improve. Um, they improve their performance. Um, but when you have, um, for example, two people working together where one is very skilled in a certain thing and the other person is less skilled, um, then usually their joint performance is worse than the better person working individually. And I think in some uh, you know, real life teams, this is pretty often the case that we have different levels of skills in the same um, area. And what it turns out is really or why this, this is um, such a problem for team performance is that there are two um, things um, working against each other. So decisions, team decisions are often based on confidence levels. So if one person is very confident that, you know, this is what we should be doing, um, then often the team decision goes in this direction. So if the very confident person is also one that is very not so skilled in a certain aspect, um, then um, this might work against another person being very skilled, but not so confident. And especially with skill, it's usually, you know, everybody knows this, the more you know about something, the more you become insecure. So often the very skilled person in some questions might be less confident than the other person who actually knows less about this. Um, and that's why in, in, all team, in all teams probably, but especially in teams that have different skill levels on a certain task, it's key to express your confidence and your skill. So you should always kind of do something, um, you know, monitor or have a wall where you put up, you know, who is like, how much of an expert in what area, or if you have a certain thing at hand, verify who actually knows how much about this and then afterwards clearly communicate your confidence. So really say, oh, I have doubts because of this. or I'm very confident because of that, so that you kind of um, get around this, um, let's call it confidence bias. Um, 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 research hotspots for neuroscience of, in are there any research hotspots for neuroscience of social interactions institutes ahead of the rest um, I think there's a couple of, um, it's not really one institute as such there. Um, there's um, the European um, University in um, Budapest um, that was supposed to be closed um, is one hotspot for, for social interaction, especially for, for joint movement, which is a joint action, which is, I think, really interesting for um, team research. Then um, 
here in Berlin at the Max Planck Institute, where I used to work, the Max Planck Institute for um, Human Development. Um, there is work on social interaction, but not so much anymore. Um, at the Berlin School of Mind and Brain, where I also work, there are still lots. Um, and then um, in the rest of the world, um, I mean, there's a couple of groups in France. Um, there's also some in Germany. Like, there's a very cool institute in, in Denmark, in Aarhus. Um, so there's, I think, if you, if you just look around a bit, you'll find it. Um, if I want to pursue this area of design in the future, how do I do? Drop me an email and um, we discuss if you can sort of um, become active in any way. Um, how do you tackle with people who suddenly get stuck in a meeting uh, due to anxiety or some trigger? Oh, um, I mean, th this is always the, 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 the question you have if, um, um, if you have people that are really um, basically have like a, like a psychological condition in terms of anxiety then um, I think, um, yeah, um, doctor psychologist, um, I think if it's just um, some minor anxiety, um, then uh, social proximity is a really good thing because it's really something that works um, against um, anxiety. So, you know, um, sort of, um, for example, um, one design thinking debriefing situation is called um, sitting around the campfire. So you just uh, don't sit on high chairs or in a classroom atmosphere, but, you know, sit on the floor, outside on the grass, um, or on cubes, um, something that lowers all of you. Um, then when you sit in this setting, that's usually something that makes a more intimate, socially, me, socially proximate um, atmosphere and might work towards, um, um, towards um, anxiety. Just drop my email here for the person that wanted to get into this and also, ah, okay, correct. Um, okay. Okay, any other questions that I didn't see or that come up now? Just throw them in. Sorry for the people that want to enter now. That's not a good moment. <laughs> Um, um, can we get the link to the video? Um, I, um, yeah, I don't know how, but I think you can. Um, so I, I think the um, DT um, bar camp organizers will take care of this. Um, yeah, campfire situation might be difficult in times of everything virtual. Actually, um, just a note on this, um, when I was putting together um, 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 this, um, this presentation, um, I was actually even thinking, oh, should I make a special section of all the things that sort of from a neuroscience perspective are difficult um, in remote settings? Um, I didn't in the end, but I think there's really quite some things um, that remote setting, um, you know, just if you look at classical um, neuroscience, social interaction literature, um, that is really um, kind of not good about remote settings. Um, so yeah. Um, I'm very interested of how this is going to go on and I think um, lots of things will be coming up um, like research on this uh, just the problem is that neuroscience um, research um, you know until it's done and published um, usually takes more something like at least two years if not longer um, and so that's not going to be helpful um, for us in the short term um, um, then do you have any book recommendations um, for neurodesign, really not. Um, uh, so we're working on a neurodesign card set at the HPI. Um, and so I, um, I, th I think that might be um, released um, around June or July, but also currently everything with Corona is changing, so I don't know. And, um, and oh yeah, somebody, okay. And I can send the recording link to sessions at the TCAM, so you'll, you'll get this. Um, yeah, so um, we'll see. Um, books are not really out there yet, but we're definitely working on um, producing something. Um, what would be a great goal for me with the research? Um, so I'm actually um, um, working now more, like less in, in the actual research itself, like what I've shown you on especially EG hyperscanning. So um, studies between two people was um, mostly my stuff. 
but I'm not doing this anymore, but I'm more working on um, sort of things, what I've just done for you, um, sort of collecting um, what is already there, because there is so much, um, so many insights in neuroscience already, um, they're just not finding it, their way towards, uh, for example, the, the design thinking community or the management community um, to really um, apply them to teamwork. So this is what I'm focusing more on now. Um, and so there, my, my big goal would be, um, yeah, <laughs> let's just make use of that more. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, why do we change personalities when we change language? Oh, that is an interesting thing. Yeah. Um, I think that's, uh, I think there m must be, I'm, I'm not so firm in the language, um, uh, literature, I must say, because language is a huge thing in neuroscience. Um, and there's like evidence, for example, that, um, when you like grow up bilingually, you store your two languages in a different way than when you acquire a language. Um, so, um, you know, one way of why you're a different personality, um, in a different language might be that usually we're speaking about one, um, that is acquired and then, um, yeah, you also access, um, it differently, you access information differently. Um, and then I think another reply to this is also from, um, uh, language and semantics um, like each language is kind of um, yeah also structured different so the way you think also changes and then um, an, a bilingual friend of mine like she speaks English and German she recently said that she thinks that um, humor is just so different um, especially like she thinks the um, yeah, anglophone um, humor is just um, very different from from German humor and it's also very linked to language and that she um, like her entire sense of humor is different um, in English so um, yeah I think definitely language um, itself plays a big role but also how it's stored in the brain um, when is your next presentation um, actually, um, I don't know yet because I, um, was mainly in, um, Elternzeit currently. So, um, not, uh, mainly working, but mainly taking care of a little baby that's now already a little boy. Um, and so I'm just, uh, with Corona, everything's different now and now I'm already restarting more. Um, so I can let you know, um, if you give me your contact. Um, so what should the environment for the session should be designed like to make the most productive design thinking session for the stakeholders very reluctant to new practices? Um, if it's in um, a, a real world context, um, then um, I think, um, I mean, I think the most crucial thing is that it's flexible um, in terms of, you know, the whole thing um, that you can change focus, uh, individual focus versus joint focus, um, can take care of emotions. Like this entire thing, I think, um, necessitates always that you um, can play around with the space, that you don't always have to be um, in the same setting around this table, for example, also not even always standing in front of a whiteboard, but that you could um, do something about this. Um, and then I personally always think if it has, um, for example, um, there's lots of evidence that nature like colors like green, for example, um, has a, just an effect on your brain. And so things like this, um, just if that the environment is also peaceful um, and stimulating, all of these things I think are the most important. But there's also um, at HPID school, for example, um, a research group focusing on innovation spaces and how they should look like. So you also may want to check those out. Um, yeah. Okay, I see that um, it's already, ah, no, there's no more next session today. Um, or am I wrong? I think five were the last ones, right? Yeah, okay, because I was going to say, otherwise you may want to go to the bathroom now. Um, but then, um, yeah, I would say if there's any other questions, um, just open your mic and ask. There's one comment from me ah. because mm -hmm. of the language and personality. Mm -hmm. So my experience is, is that you are not changing personality, you are changing the culture. Because, mm -hmm. for example, it, if a child... Um, is learning a language, then he is learning this in a special culture, in an environment. So and if you are changing the language, then you are changing the culture or within this culture. That's why you are changing the culture and not only the personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, might absolutely. Totally agree. Um, I just saw one more question that um, 
Do you have a recommendation for a remote working environment that would be more stimulating? Um, so I have to say until uh, very recently, um, I've been um, only exclusively working in um, uh, like actual uh, physical where you're in the same place workshops. So um, um, I don't really have any good recommendations for um, stimulating remote environments. Um, I really like working with Miro now and also, um, yeah, but um, I think it's really, it's so up to how many people are joining, like with how many people you're working and um, I'm just not at all um, an expert on that yet. Um, do you have a tip for collaboration between designers and software development team? Um, do you want to ask the question in uh, real? Because um, it really depends on what you, like, you know, what level um, the, of collaboration you want to address. So, so, so I just wanted to uh, yes. know because software developers, development team uh, tends to be very technical, mm -hmm. and uh, designers have their own approach to well, uh, problem solving. So, if you have any, and they're two very different mindsets. If mm -hmm. you have a tip around for uh, you know in terms for, in terms of collaboration for that um, for that. I actually, yeah, with this, I think that design thinking is a very good framework in terms of um, you know that. I think the main thing is um, how can you have a shared goal, you know, that because because often if you, for example, say you have technical people and let's say creative people, other called, um, then they often tend to think, you know, that the actual goal and focus is something different. Um, so I think really clarifying, OK, what are we actually working towards? And what do we, the design people and what do we, the uh, software people think is the most important um, goal or most important aspect of this. Clarifying this beforehand I think is very helpful and then um, I think also um, um, sort of the design thinking um, structure you know that just that you make sure and what what phase of the process uh, of the project are you you know are you more into ideation is it really um, that you're done and you're, you're done with like this project steps and you're in testing now and then going into iteration um, I think those um, can already help at least from my experience. But it, I think then it, it's really the, the devil is in the detail. Right. If that helps. Yeah, th thank you. Okay, you're welcome. All right, um, then I think, um, yeah, since we're approaching um, six o'clock and an hour is always the limit for um, how long a talk should be, right? Um, um, yeah, if you have any other questions, just drop me an email line and um, I'm very gladful for, uh, very grateful for, for the nice replies you're just leaving. Um, I'm not going to read them to all of you since they're addressing feedback uh, directed towards me anyways, that's fine. Um, um, and yeah, so thanks a lot for your interest. I'm happy to see that so many people um, are interesting, uh, interested in your design. Um, that motivates me to keep going with it. And um, yeah. Then just have a nice evening and oh yeah, keep writing these thank you mails. Um, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, keep uh, keep uh, yeah, have a nice evening and uh, maybe see you tomorrow in one of the other sessions. Um, bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> Thanks. Welcome. Look forward to your presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Really brilliant. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Caroline. What stuff you're presenting. <laughs> Thanks. I'm very happy. <laughs> very, very interesting. <laughs> hey, Joey. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, Caroline. It was great. Very interesting. Bye. <laughs> you soon, no, please. Have lunch or an abend. Wow, doch. Danke, tschüss.